This webinar will be given by Benoit Sabot from CA France, and this webinar is shared by Raphael Garia from NRC Canada, who is chair of the TCIF for SIM and also a member of the CSRI Communication Working Group. So please, Raphael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're very fortunate today to uh, to have uh, Benoit uh, Sabot. Benoit uh, finished his Bachelor of Physics and Chemistry in Clermont-Ferrand University. Shortly thereafter, he started working at uh, uh, at LNHB, where he completed his uh, master's internship in nuclear physics, working on the radon to 222 primary standard, of which I'm sure we'll hear some some more about that. Um, following that, he, he started his thesis right away, uh, also at LNHB, uh, developing the uh, Thoron stand, primary standard. Um, and since uh, 2016, he's been employed uh, as a permanent staff uh, and member at LNHB. Um, he's also been doing incredible work uh, developing new scintillation-based uh, reference methods for liquid solutions and also radioactive gases. Um, so today we'll be hearing a, a little bit about his uh, his work on the primary standards for both radon uh, and some history and its current status of, of those standards. So without further ado, Benoit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rafael. So, okay. Hello, uh, so uh, hello, everyone. Um, so um, the subject of this talk has a nice, uh, let's say, uh, title, but I will mainly focus on the development of different uh, radon and turon standards, which are quite a nice subject to me, as uh, said Raphael, because it was in fact my PhD and student work in the past. At LNHB. So during this talk, I will of course introduce the general question uh, of radon, present some primary standards of radon, how to use them, and then we'll move to another isotope of radon, which is thorium. And what I would like to finish is with some unusual uh, example of the use of such standard for very specific and quite funny application. Uh, so, first off, an introduction. What is radon? I hope that many of you know about it. Radon is a, a, a natural radioactive gas. And from the website of IAEA, we can find a very nice picture which uh, explains um, almost everything about radon for people. It's one of the natural radiation sources. So from time to time, it's even the main uh, uh, natural radioactive source. Uh, depending on where you are on the, on the world. Uh, some places are really uh, prone to, to produce radon. You have uh, many uh, isotopes of uranium in the ground. And so it's uh, quite uh, challenging to make sure uh, we respect some limit because as it was mentioned by uh, the World Health Organization, radon, is estimated to cause between 3 to percent to 40 percent of lung cancer around the world, which is non negligible. Often we say that it's just behind uh, smoking people. And we can find different kinds of isotopes uh, of radon. But here we spoke mainly about two of them the radon 222, uh, which has 2.8 days of half life and which is coming from uranium. 238 in the ground, and the one we call Toron, which is a uh, radon 220 with uh, less than one minute half life, and which is coming from Toron 232, which is in the ground. One last one, which is called Actinon. Uh, we won't talk about it because there is no specific standard about this one, but at certain point it was uh, an issue because. Uh, some people were planning to use radium-223 for medical purpose, and uh, people using just nuclide may be exposed to actinum, even if uh, the half life is extremely short of uh, less than four seconds. Uh, anyway, radon in air is a risk for everyone uh, due to uh, its particularity. 
Um, it can be risk at home, but also at workplace. And again, with this nice picture from uh, IA, we can see that uh, it can be very dangerous uh, and a real problem when you are, you are dealing at some workplace, especially under the ground. Uh, and at the end, uh, what we can find uh, on, on general recommendation for the World, uh, World F, uh, Organization is that for the public, we can set threshold below 100 becquerel per cubic meter where there is no significant effect or problem. And if we look at uh, European guideline, we have even a threshold that has to be respected of 300 becquerel per cubic meter for people. Also, we are speaking here mainly on uh, radon in air, but there are also some non negligible effects of radon in water, uh, which could be a, a further uh, subject on this case. So, radon risk uh, evaluation, uh, we can find some very interesting map, especially with the last. Uh, uh, just uh, document uh, produced by the European Commission, where you can find some uh, nice map that will give you some uh, warning uh, about uh, radon prone area, where you can find a uh, high concentration or not. Uh, there are many maps from different countries that were gathered in Europe uh, to create such uh, information and to publish them uh, for people so that they know, uh, do I have a risk uh, in my home or at my work? Should I take care of it? Should I make some measurement? Uh, such map may come from some measurement uh, that were carried out. Uh, for example, in France, I know that uh, in each town hall or school uh, during a time, uh, our uh, team of uh, IRSN uh, get uh, a lot of measurements uh, to know if uh, we have a, a high concentration or not of radon in some spot. And uh, they use this uh, kind of result to create uh, a, a radon map on, on the, in France. We can find such uh, similar 2D in other countries, or from time to time, we have some combined uh, measurement of uh, ground composition, uh, ground permeability and uh, the deduction of uh, potential radon uh, activity concentration in some place. Of course, this is not only for Europe. And one of, another example I found is uh, a map from uh, USA uh, that show uh, where you can find some uh, high radon concentration and where you should uh, try to um, do measurement or take some. Uh, uh, to, to take to take some uh, consideration about red. Uh, for some countries, such as France, it's even become uh, a requirement. Like when you sell your house, uh, you will have uh, to fill some paper and to show to the people that buy your house that you are not in a random prone area or that you are in a prone area. However, it's not mandatory to do measurement, it's just for now uh, a kind of warning, uh, be careful, you may have a lot of freedom, uh, you may have to check it. Um, anyway, as it's a quite challenging subject, it's worldwide, there are some risks, and so it's important to perform measurement in order uh, to take into account this activity concentration in your house, and uh, to make in sort that uh, your radon atmosphere, uh, your, your atmosphere is free of radon. So that's why even uh, we have uh, some measurement device that are developed. We also can find some kind of automatic ventilation system that will take into account the radon concentration to reduce the activity concentration in your room and so on. So it's uh, uh, quite a subject and quite important in some place. Uh, however, the rules are not uh, worldwide. It may vary and change uh, over all the places. For now, one, what is important to know and what will be the subject of this uh, uh, presentation is that 
as there is a problem, many people have developed detectors. I found some picture of them, but there are much more. Uh, and this detector, you will use it to measure activity concentration. And what is very important is to know how they work and so on. Uh, this is not really my job to develop such a device. My job was to develop standards. So that's what we will talk about it. Uh, however, it's still important to know uh, how these systems are working, what they are used for, and especially what kind of uh, technology is used. For example, the first one you can see on the screen here are different uh, electronic devices. And when we look at the specification, you can measure from very low activity concentration to few brick per cubic meter up to very high concentration of megabecker per cubic meter. So you have a very wide range of concentration and uh, this can be quite challenging for metrology. There are different kinds of sensors, uh, such as semiconductor using silicon detector, ionization chamber, uh, sensation flask, uh, inorganic scintillator and so on. All these technology have uh, some kind of benefits or problem and we need to find them. This active detector can be very sensitive. They can be, uh, they can work very well and can be now connected with a modern wireless connection. You can have your data on the web server and so on and you can directly measure at uh, the, for example, in Korea and you have your results in France. Uh, so today it can be easy to, to find such detector. However, often the price is uh, non-negligible and they are mainly buy by uh, um, government or by uh, university or any uh, people doing study on Radon. And they are not really uh, suitable for public due to their price. So that's why also there is another kind of detector that were uh, developed, which are passive detector, very cheap. They are not precise to give you uh, a very precise activity concentration, but at least they are good to say if you have radon risk uh, in your house. And in this picture, you can find some standard one I found on the internet, which are in fact based on solid state uh, nuclear track detector that we are used uh, uh, to measure um, the dose of people working in reactor, for example, but that are now used to measure uh, um, to see if you have radon in uh, an house. And one other very funny, um, uh, let's say, track detector is a uh, one nice uh, measurement technique, which is based on the compact disc uh, for retrospective radon measurement. Uh, it's a, a team from uh, Sofia University that developed such a technique and use it uh, for many kinds of study, where they use, in fact, uh, the compact disc you can find in your house to uh, look at the track of uh, the alpha particle inside the plastic of the compact disc and deduce uh, some uh, radon concentration. So this one is uh, quite cheap also to, to use. And since usually you know when you buy both uh, the, these compact discs, you can use it as a very long-term uh, uh, detector for one. Anyway, uh, all these techniques, uh, of course, need calibration. You need to know how they work. Uh, especially how they work with different radon isotopes, because as we say, there are two main uh, isotopes of radon. And several aspects must be taken into account, like uh, the detection efficiency uh, of the calibrated device, but also the linearity of the response, uh, the volume activity range, the time response. Some uh, uh, radon detector can uh, uh, give uh, a response of activity concentration quite slowly or at the opposite very fast. Also, how they act when you have a mix of radon and total atmosphere. And of course, the response depending on temperature, pressure, humidity condition, and so on, because you are measuring in uh, the environment and you are not able to always uh, know uh, all these parameters and how they will change over the days. So 
In order to assess properly this aspect, uh, we need to have a, a standard activity and or activity concentration of red. And in this webinar, I will focus on the different standards uh, developed for radon metrology and the uh, calibration technique that can be used and that are used uh, usually these days. So first off, I will start with primary standard for radon. Uh, so when I say radon, is radon 222. And this uh, radon is coming from uranium 238 decay scheme. Uh, from this nice picture, we can uh, see uh, where it's coming from, so uranium. You will have some different kind of actinine before it becomes uh, radon-226, and radon-226 will produce radon-222. Uh, radon-222 emit alpha. It has a half-life of 3.8 days, and it will produce decay products, uh, which are isotopes of lead, bismuth, and polonium. All of them will emit either alpha or beta particle and also, of course, uh, gamma uh, emission. It's a quite complex scheme uh, where you have a lot of emission, a lot of different kind uh, way to detect it. And that's why you may have sensitive detection or may have problem to detect uh, some of those. One interesting part is when you look at the scheme is that radium-226 has a half-life of more than 1,600 years. So it can be used as a, a solid source to produce radon, which will be interesting as, as you will see uh, in the next slide. And then you can use this uh, produce radon to prepare standards and uh, spread it over the world. The last point is uh, when you look at the scheme, often you will see that radon uh, decay uh, with uh, a few days into uh, isotopes that have a quite short half-life. And when we look at the first part of the scheme here, uh, all of them will be at the equilibrium within uh, four hours if you are in a closed volume. At the end, it will remain one uh, uh, isotope mainly that can be a problem when you measure alpha, which is polonium-210, and you will see why uh, later on this slides. So what I found when I uh, worked on the radon standard is uh, one of the first techniques which were developed by NIST in USA in the 90s. In fact, it was the, the work of uh, Mr. Coley. And uh, this uh, technique was based on the production of radon uh, using a radon-226 standard solution uh, to uh, generate uh, a non-activity of radon-226. Uh, this generative activity was checked, used uh, a pulse ion chamber developed by uh, NIST. And uh, it was necessary to develop a very complex uh, system in order to generate radon and spread it uh, in different uh, kinds of solution uh, in air or in water or any uh, other mixture. Uh, when we look at this work, uh, which was quite interesting, one of the complex parts uh, was to produce the radon uh, from a liquid solution because in this work, they use uh, a non-activity uh, liquid solution of radon-226, where they bubble uh, nitrogen, nitrogen steam to take the radon and uh, place it uh, and mix it into a, a, a tubing. At the end, you have uh, an, uh, a solution, which is uh, acid, and you must be careful to uh, remove any acid vapors and so on. So, you need behind this such system a complex purification uh, with uh, some kind of uh, uh, quite good handling of the gas mixture. And uh, in this system, they use their uh, chamber to measure the activity concentration uh, once the air is clean uh, from uh, moisture and uh, acid. And they, they use it to, to define the emission rate of such a solution and to then produce uh, atmosphere and the standard for radon 222. 
Uh, at that time, it was the, the only uh, technique that uh, I found. And starting a few years later, uh, a first primary standard of radon was developed, this time with uh, direct measurement of radon. And this was uh, done at CA LNHB. Uh, and in fact, it was done by Jean-Louis Piccolo in the 1995. And this is one of the methods I will present you because it was my first work at LNHB to make some uh, upgrade of the system and to uh, make it work well. Uh, basically, in this technique, uh, we want to measure directly radon. And what we know is that radon emit alpha radiation, so we have to measure alpha particle. The radon half-life is 3.8 days, so it's quite enough to produce an activity, measure it, store it, and send it to people. And the idea was to use the defined solid angle method, which is used for alpha uh, solid source, uh, to measure uh, a radon primary standard. So this first prototype was developed in 1995, I said, and I made sure a grade in, in 2012 at the end of my master degree. And this is the, re the development and the work I will present here. So as I said, uh, the, uh, the concept of this technique was to use the defined solid angle method to measure radon. Uh, what is this method? Uh, you can find a quite nice uh, publication from Stefan Pome in Metrologia that will give you a lot of detailed defined solid angle method. But the concept is as follows. You have um, a source, a solid source, uh, producing uh, alpha particle. Uh, in front of this source, you will place uh, a collimator and then an, an alpha detector. The idea is that every uh, particle, alpha particle reaching the detector are detected and contained. And we will use the uh, mechanic part to uh, create a defined uh, solid angle that can be used to uh, uh, calculate a geometric factor, in fact, detection efficiency. At the end, in this measurement, you don't need to calibrate it. You just need to measure every distance uh, and diameter of the source or any other parameter to calculate the uh, geometrical factor and then the detection efficiency. However, when we look at this technique, uh, the problem is that you can use it only on a solid source that is placed in front of the collimator. And so we need a solid source of radon. Uh, just to keep in mind, radon is a radioactive noble gases, and so it's quite difficult to produce a solid source of radon. However, uh, Mr. Piccolo finds some solution in the past, and he is uh, what you can find today in our lab with the new system. In fact, the concept is to use a radium 226 source to produce radon under vacuum. So you can use different kinds of source. Here in this uh, system, we have uh, two kinds of source, 3.6 uh, megabecrel and 500 uh, kilobecrel. We use it to produce uh, some amount of radon. Uh, the idea is that we make the vacuum in the solid source, uh, we close it and we wait a certain time to reach uh, a desired activity. Of course, if we wait a maximum of 20 days, we will reach the maximum activity inside the source. So this is for the first part of the system, where you have bound, pressure goes, and so on, which is here in the picture, and you will produce radon. But once produced, you need to measure it, and this was the quite challenging part, is to create a defined solid angle and create a solid source of radon. So this is the second part of this measurement uh, setup, and it's the measurement chamber. One of the key of the system is to able to freeze radon at the surface of a metal surface, uh, what we call the cold finger, in fact, in the lab. So you can see one example of this uh, cold finger here. It's in fact a stainless steel uh, disc of 100 micrometer thickness, uh, where you have a soldered, uh, laser soldered uh, nickel rod. 
the idea of this call finger is that the nickel road has a very good conductivity and you can solder it uh, on stainless steel. The call finger will be linked to a call head to reduce the temperature at the maximum as possible. And the stainless steel membrane will make sure that we separate the measurement chamber from the coal held uh, below uh, this measurement chamber. On the corner of the stainless steel disc, uh, you will have the heating part that will make sure the temperature of the finger is outside of the finger is stable and set at a normal temperature 20 degrees Celsius or 293 uh, Kelvin. Keep in mind that all the system is under vacuum, so we will only deal with uh, radon atoms and a few remaining gas from vacuum. So the key is to force radon on this cold surface and in this uh, work, we had to know where are exactly the melting point, solidification point, and so on of radon under low pressure condition. And what we can find that below 100 Kelvin, it is possible to have solid uh, radon under our pressure uh, condition, which is vacuum. In our best case, it's 10 to the power minus 6 uh, hectopascal. So knowing that, uh, we could uh, uh, find the best uh, compromise between a good temperature and a solidification of radon on the cold finger. And to do so, we need to uh, do some calculation, which are in fact a simple uh, physics calculation and thermal conductivity calculation. Uh, the idea is not to go to too low temperature because when you have a very low temperature, we may increase uh, the cold surface of the cold finger. And we found out that uh, if it's too hot and over 100 Kelvin, uh, the radon won't froze and it will remain gases. So with this simulation, we could find the best compromise uh, that is a, a sketch on the, this picture. Uh, you can imagine that on the right, you have a cut of the cold finger, which is the temperature map on the surface. If our nickel rod is at 50 Kelvin or if it's quite close to 100 Kelvin. So you will see that on the surface of the uh, cold finger, we may have a region, a diameter, uh, where the temperature is below 100 Kelvin and so that the uh, radon uh, will froze on the surface. And the idea was to optimize to find the best temperature to make uh, solid radiators. Uh, at the end, uh, this uh, technique uh, was used uh, to find uh, the best at 80 Kelvin and this uh, result were checked uh, by different measurements, and one you can find on, the, on different publications and more recent publication from Chris is a very nice uh, picture of uh, such source. Here you have a 3D picture of uh, deposited radon on such cold finger with uh, the distribution of the activity, and you can see that. Uh, well, this such source can produce very nice and homogeneous uh, distribution of radon on the cold surface, so it's a, a very nice uh, alpha source. Then uh, at the end, you need to cool down this finger, and always uh, we typically use what we call cryo uh, generator, which is a huge copper head that can cool down, for example, at 40 Kelvin, but you can set the temperature as you want. And uh, this uh, such low temperature may uh, create some defor deformation of the cold finger as it's very thin. And you can see it on this simulation uh, we performed in the past, that if the cold finger is quite well fixed to, to this head, it will make some deformation. So that means the di distance between the collimator and the source may change with the temperature. 
So one of the tips of this technique is to find a good way to make a link between the cold finger part and the cold head below of the, uh, on the generator so that you don't have too much deformation and so that you end up with a very precise measurement of distance between your source and your collimator, which is always the, the important point in a, a, a defined solenoid method. So what we found in our uh, system is that since we know with a relative, uh, let's say not so bad accuracy diameter of our source, uh, we may uh, take a long distance between our frozen source and our collimator in order to minimize our, uh, this effect. Although if we have some, uh, Thermal deformation of the cold finger, it's maybe important to increase the distance between our source and our collimator to make sure that this effect is quite small. So that's why in our system, we end up with such uh, size. The distance between uh, the source and the collimator is 10 centimeters. Uh, the radius of the collimator is nine millimeter. The diameter of the source is uh, the, the radius of the source is three millimeter, and we have estimated that uh, if the source is not uh, perfectly in the center of our system, even with one millimeter, it's uh, completely negligible for our geometric factor uh, due to the high distance between the collimator and the source. And so we end up with a geometrical factor that can be measured by distance. Uh, measurement uh, with a uh, quite uh, good uh, relative uncertainty. At the end, uh, we say, okay, we have a defined cylinder, we can frost right on, we can make picture of this frozen soup that seems to be uh, homogeneous, but uh, maybe some of the radon is not froze, how can we check it? And here, thanks to some physics effects, uh, we can see directly on the spectra. In fact, uh, when we produce such source uh, with uh, radon solidification, it's like you have the best uh, source ever as a solid alpha emission source, because you have few atoms of radon and few remaining atoms of gas, so there is no much uh, uh, other compound on the source. And you are, you can have a very nice and very good resolution spectrum without long tail on the alpha spectrum. And what you can see on these two pictures, on the left is the spectrum of radon, uh, frozen radon at 80 Kelvin on the core finger, where you can find the main peak of radon and also the small peak at 0.07% uh, uh, intensity emission of radon 22, and also the decay product. If we look closely to the uh, spectrum of radon, even though we have only few atoms, in the case we increase the temperature, we we'll still see some frozen radon peak, but immediately when we reach uh, over the limit of uh, sol radon solidification, a uh, second peak of radon will appear, and it's like the radon that becomes gases. So in case of problem, we can immediately see on the spectra that some radon becomes gaseous and that the measurement is not uh, performed in proper condition. So at the end, uh, we have a production of radon, a technique with a quite good precision to measure radon. In our lab, it's typically between 100 becquerel up to 4 mega becquerel with a relative standard density of 0.3%. But the important part is now, how can I give this standard to people so that they can use it as they want? And in fact, uh, we can use a very simple technique and it's the, the technique used in the last part of the device uh, by using um, liquid nitrogen bath uh, that we place around a vial, that can be a metal vial or glass vial. Uh, we can uh, transfer the radon from uh, the cold finger, which is now at normal temperature, into the vial. And then we can close the vial 
we can even check after that that the radon, uh, there is no remaining radon into the tube. And the standard is then stored in the vial and we can send it to people, give it to people or make other students. Uh, one of the good things we saw with this system is that it presents a good linearity. When you prepare a radon standard, you place it to the vial, you move it to somewhere, you connect it again, and you perform again and again the same measurement with the same sample. You will have a very nice uh, compatibility with the results, uh, and that means uh, it's quite easy to transfer a radon between the measurement chamber and the sample. Uh, this is due to one critical part, is just the tubing diameter that will uh, allow a good diffusion between the radon chamber, measurement chamber and the radon sample holder. So the, the key is to manage and have a very huge uh, or good uh, uh, diameter of tubing so that the diffusion is fast. Uh, however, there is uh, one limitation uh, with this system. Even though, even though you need just half a day, let's say, to prepare a standard, uh, when you use it a lot, with time, you will see that uh, polonium-210 is growing on the cold finger because uh, when you measure very high activity of radon and that you repeat this for many years, uh, the decay product will accumulate on the cold finger surface as it's a solid uh, while the radon solid. And thus we'll have polonium-210 that will come with time. And unfortunately, polonium-210 is growing uh, quite close to radon-222 peak. And so this is one of the limits of the system is that with time, we'll have more and more polonium on the cold finger. You cannot remove it because it's recoiled and it's inside the metal. It's not possible to clean it. So you need to change uh, this cold finger part from time to time. And this can be the, uh, let's say the more difficult part is to find a good way uh, to hold the cold finger and to be able to change it uh, easily. Uh, anyway, what we saw is that this standard is quite useful. We can send it all over the world and we did it. We even sent one to Korea and it was ready to use. So it can travel a long distance and can be very useful. And uh, thanks to this system, what I saw since I'm uh, in LNHB is that it was quite nice to meet uh, other people from that, uh, other National Meteorological Institute to talk with them and to see them uh, uh, use this technique, develop a similar one or try to implement it uh, in their lab. And from what I know up to now, uh, we can find this technique in uh, some other lab in the world, like in China and South Korea, Switzerland or Germany. And that all these lab have uh, developed uh, this technique and use it to, to prepare standard of running. Uh, at the end, when we are speaking about metrology, uh, we want to reach uh, international traceability. And to do so, we try to work on the, on the, with the BIPM. And so our first uh, idea was to submit uh, at the International Reference System, SIR, from BIPM, BIPM uh, a glass and pool. Uh, which is filled with a radon standard. And uh, so to do this, it's a bit different than uh, the standard technique used by SIR because in this case, we need to have uh, a glass ampoule that can handle a uh, huge pressure difference, bit, bit, sorry, huge pressure difference between uh, uh, the outside of the vial and the inside of the vial. And this was in fact, quite more challenging than what we expect because uh, for radon, we are dealing with a gas and this gas will move everywhere in the vial and especially depending on how you solder uh, the vial, 
uh, you will have some distribution of the radon and the decay product inside the tubing that will change the response um, and the detection efficiency of the uh, ionization chamber of uh, the refuel sentence system. Uh, so at the end, and thanks to the all this work with BIPM, we haven't found a proper way to do it uh, with the C system. Even if we turn it into metal on, uh, metal uh, ampoule, uh, metal vial, that is not so simple to find a very small and compact vial that will go into this uh, reference chamber. So while it's supposed to be uh, the, the very nice way to compare each other between other enemies uh, that we use for liquid uh, solution, for gas, it's start to be a real nightmare. And so at the end, uh, the only uh, chance we have to do uh, international uh, comparison is uh, by doing uh, a CCI uh, supplementary comparison uh, between different labs, what we did, and what was also very nice because it's always uh, a, a way to exchange with other national metrology institutes to share our method and to see how it goes. And you have here two examples, one that was done during a uh, uh, metro radon project, European project, uh, between different uh, laboratories from uh, uh, Europe. And one other, which was smaller, but that was a comparison between uh, China, uh, Irametas, and LNHB. Also, we did a few other, but uh, I wanted to show this because they were uh, quite challenging one, especially for Sylvie that did a lot at this time. And uh, it was not uh, always easy to send such a sample. So in these two international comparisons, uh, we took two different kinds of philosophy. The first one is that at the lab, uh, we connected together many vials of the same uh, or very similar volume. Anyway, we, we measure the volume, we know the volume of each vial. And we uh, connected a, a radon vial to all of these and the radon moved in all the vials that were in the vacuum. So it was a, an homogeneous distribution of the gas inside of the vial. And we send all these, all these vials to each participant so that we compare each other to know the activity uh, of uh, each standard. And on the other one, we try another philosophy that it, uh, in NNHB, we prepared a standard. We send it to IRA Metas that measured the standard. And IRA Metas send it to China so that they measure it again. And China send it back to NNHB so that we measure, uh, we perform a last uh, shaking measurement. What we did, what we saw with this traveling uh, uh, standard that at the end, after the four measurements, it seems that the uh, activity was 0.6% lower than the expected uh, send value. But even if we may say that maybe it was some losses, we are just within the uncertainty of each measurement. So we are not sure of that. At the end, uh, all of them were uh, uh, we are in good agreement. So that's also a good way to compare each other and to make sure we have uh, some kind of international comparison with the Radon standard. So that, that's it for the Radon primary standard, but it's good to have a Radon primary standard, but the important part is to use it to calibrate commercial device. And in this slide, I would like to show you uh, some method I learned uh, on how we can calibrate uh, with uh, radon primary standard. First, to calibrate a radon sensor, you need a calibration facility. Uh, in this slide, I show you the one I developed. It's a more complex one than radon because it's used for all the uh, radioactive gas. But the, the concept is basically all the same when you have a, a radon chamber, and this is why I would like to, to show you a few of the developments. Uh, the idea uh, of this method is to uh, uh, 
place your device inside uh, the volume, the closed volume, and you will connect uh, your random standard on it. So this is what we call, uh, what we can call the primary calibration. Um, the idea is to know the activity of the random standard and to know the volume of our system. So since we know the uh, activity and the volume of our chamber, we can deduce the volume, uh, the volume activity uh, inside the chamber, and we can even calculate it depending of uh, the time because it just follow the decay of radon to two. Uh, this technique can be very useful to calibrate the reference instruments, and it. I think it is, I think, the most precise technique you can use. The key is get a random standard. And second, measure precisely the volume of your chamber. And what typically, typically I, I do uh, is to measure the volume using uh, a reference volume and a uh, pressure temperature uh, uh, a measurement inside the system. Uh, you can do this by, uh, for example, doing vacuum in your chamber, fill a reference volume that is certified. Uh, it's easy to certify a volume, a small volume, by just uh, uh, placing water inside and we doing a wet measurement. Anyway, at the end, you will fill this volume. You will measure precisely the pressure and the temperature. And by opening the valve uh, of each uh, line that are under vacuum, you could use the, uh, uh, the calculation of the pressure equilibrium to deduce the volume of your chamber. Uh, in example, if I do this on uh, one of uh, the small chamber we use, we can measure very precisely uh, the volume of this chamber, uh, which is here uh, roughly close to 125 liter. Uh, of course, uh, it's not uh, always suitable to do vacuum inside your chamber, especially when you place a very sensitive detector inside. So you can uh, reproduce this technique uh, using uh, still uh, uh, differential pressure measurement. Of course, the uncertainty will be just large. At the end, as I say, uh, we have the activity of the standard. We know the volume of our chamber. So at, at any time, we can have the volumic activity of our chamber with the detector to calibrate inside. Uh, what we just have to be careful is uh, the problem of timing. So we need to have a reference time, uh, a good uh, uh, time server, for example, and make sure that we calculate the activity at the corresponding measurement time of the device. And the last uh, part to take into account is that the device to calibrate uh, needs some certain acquisition time. And during this, uh, acquisition time, the radon activity is decaying. So we need to make some uh, integrated calculation of the activity concentration at the right time of the measurement uh, time of the, de uh, the device to calibrate. So these are the, the idea of the uh, calculation presented here. And the last part to take into account is that for a given time, uh, the the reference radon volume activity is known, but the device to calibrate has some kind of background. And so we need to correct uh, the activity uh, concentration measured by the uh, device to calibrate from its own background. And at the end, what we have is that we have an activity, a volumic activity measured by the instrument to calibrate. calibrate. Uh, the volumic activity from the standard. So we can compare both to have a ratio and to give this as an indicator depending on the activity concentration. So what I learned is in fact, back uh, in my PhD study, uh, when I was working at LNHB, in fact, I was also working at IRSM uh, that we are using Baccarat which was a, a huge uh, gas chamber of one cubic meter. 
And in this system, we were using uh, the Radon standard in Baccarat uh, with uh, here you have an example of two devices. One which is based on pulsed ion chamber technique and one that is based on um, uh, spectrometry, in fact, alpha spectrometry. And what you can see here is the effect of background because with the pulse ion chamber, in this case, it was using the total counting. So that means with time, this ion chamber has some contamination of uh, polonium 210 inside. So the background is non negligible and starting from the high activity down to uh, low activity concentration, we start to have some effect of the background. So that's why it's important to correct from the background uh, uh, of uh, the device to calibrate, uh, which is not the case of this other device that is using uh, uh, alpha spectrometry. And especially uh, this one was using uh, the polonium 280 peak uh, for, uh, measure, for deducing uh, radon activity concentration. And uh, then if we look at this uh, calculation of ratio that uh, we did in the past, is that it can be very useful because you will have in fact uh, an idea of the response of the instrument over a very wide range of activity concentration. Uh, typically what we were doing is that we were preparing uh, a standard of 50 kilobecquerel of radon to two and the uh, back chamber was one cubic meter. So in fact, we are starting with roughly 50 kilobecquerel per cubic meter of radon. And we follow the decay uh, during one month or more uh, inside the chamber. So we can at any time calculate the activity compared to the response of the device and obtain such uh, a calibration curve. So this technique is very useful. However, as I said, it's time consuming in terms of, uh, uh, especially in terms of radon exposition time because we typically do that for more than a month. So that means the device is inside the chamber for more than a month and you gather all this data. So that's why uh, this technique is very useful uh, for what I, will call a reference device, a device that you will calibrate with primary standard and that then you will use to uh, calibrate many detectors but with less uh, calibration points. Uh, so at the end, the important part in this is to select the best reference device you can find uh, because uh, you may need to have something that have a nice uh, response between a very large range of activity concentration. So it needs a high sensitivity, of course, uh, quite a low measurement uncertainty. Uh, the response must be linear uh, with the activity concentration. And if possible, it must have a low background. So all this combined, it's not so easy to find uh, uh, reference uh, device. So I will say that at the end, it's always the best to design your own reference device because you will know how it works. For Radon, it's, it's not, let's say, not so uh, difficult. Um, uh, let's say that uh, it's always difficult you, especially if you want to reach a low background because you always have this problem of polynomial to 10 when you reach uh, high sensitivity of detection uh, for radon. Uh, anyway, this is one of the parts when you want to calibrate uh, a reference device. However, we don't really need always this. And most of the people need to perform secondary calibration because uh, for example, what I know from my colleague of Harry Rissen, uh, they may have uh, 50, uh, or more active detector, and they want to perform uh, primary calibration on all of them. It's too much of work. So what they do is that 
they have a reference device, they do primary calibration on it, and they will use it to calibrate other radon detector. And the good point is that you can use almost the same uh, setup uh, that I showed previously. Uh, the idea in this case will be to generate a stable radon atmosphere to place the reference instrument inside and the instrument to calibrate and gather the result over uh, a certain time period. So what is critical in this case is uh, to be able to have uh, air inlet in the system on the radon to the six source, for example, that will produce the radon. Uh, to mix uh, this air with maybe other gases or uh, other kind of uh, atmosphere. Uh, to make sure that it is homogeneous inside the chamber. So for radon, typically a fan is quite enough to make sure of that inside even uh, one cubic or more uh, 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 chamber. And then you need some air outlet so that the atmosphere is stable over time. Uh, let's say that in this part, the most critical will be to find the proper radion two to six source, depending on what activity range you want and uh, what chamber you have. Uh, but at the end, as you have your reference instrument, as long as uh, it's a good reference instrument and it's calibrated with the primary standard, you will have a good reference value to compare with the system. So here I just show you what is the critical part in such system. So this is the uh, radon chamber, the radioactive gas chamber I made in LNGP. Uh, what I can say is that when you are when you want to develop such uh, system, the critical part is the green one here on the screen. It's the mixture of gas, and especially the choice of uh, mass flow controller you will use when you want to mix uh, some gas line. Uh, a very accurate system is quite important here. And then you can do any mixture. Next step is to make sure you are always in the good condition to produce radon from radon to the six source. Some source may not um, support moisture in air, so you have to use very dry air to produce your radon. And then you will need to mix on a second line with, uh, for example, uh, high humidity concentration in air. Uh, to make uh, some kind of mixture at different humidity concentration and so on. But at the end, when you have uh, a good setup, you can really produce the very stable activity concentration over days and months without any problem. Uh, but the important part is uh, that to get a good reference instrument that will be able to, to measure it. So as I said, the stability of the radon concentration inside the vessel uh, must be as good as possible because you will want to calibrate the radon device for specific activity. For example, as I said in Europe, as soon as uh, above 200 Becker per cubic meter, we have to do something. So this can be an interesting point to calibrate and uh, one lower and maybe one or two higher. And uh, this is why you will need to have a stable activity so that you make sure the device will reach equilibrium with your atmosphere and that will gather enough uh, content statistics to make a proper comparison between the reference instrument and the device to calibrate. Uh, what is, is more interesting in such uh, um, a setup compared to the primary uh, calibration is that here you will be able to produce radon atmosphere with many kind, uh, many different humidity, temperature, 
and study a lot of different kind of influences on the measurement. So it's, let's say, the most uh, useful way to produce a radon atmosphere and to study many effects on your detector system or on materials and so on. Uh, what you have to find at the end is uh, what are the best points of calibration in terms of activity concentration. It may depend on the rules, as I said, but it may depend also on the apparatus to calibrate. And what I learned is that sometimes it can be very difficult because you have a new device to calibrate. And of sometimes there is no much detail about the device. So you need to understand how it works to make sure you will uh, calibrate it properly in the group range uh, that you will find the time response of the device and that you will make sure that uh, you have uh, measured the linearity part of the device and other problem. Of course, it always depends on the chamber capability. I know that uh, some uh, colleagues uh, from other national labs like uh, INEA and PTB uh, uh, made a huge chamber where they can place a lot of detector and made other kind of studies. But of course, when you have huge chamber, then you have other challenge uh, to produce atmosphere and especially homogeneous atmosphere and stable with time. Uh, at the end, how do we calibrate the device? Uh, in fact, it's quite simple. Uh, we know the uh, activity of the reference instrument and the background of the reference instrument. Uh, we also know the response of the reference instrument compared to the standards. So, in fact, we have a reference activity concentration that can be measured. And we have to compare this result with uh, the activity concentration measured by uh, the instrument to calibrate, uh, always, of course, corrected from the background. And then you can find uh, a, new, a new ratio uh, that will be the comparison between uh, the act reference activity measured and uh, activity uh, measured by the instrument to calibrate. So what I learned uh, from this calibration, it was mainly during the previous project, I participated in the framework of Paramet, like during Metro Radon for the most recent one, uh, where uh, our colleagues uh, from different laboratories uh, made comparisons of uh, um, calibration of device. So in this case, uh, for example, they took uh, one uh, alpha guard, uh, which is a commercial device. Uh, and then it was calibrated uh, between different institutes and the response of the device were, were, were compared for different activity. Uh, in fact, during this project, they even made uh, two different comparisons at uh, very uh, different activity range. Uh, and of course, if you want to know more about that, you have a, a website, which is a Metro Radon website, and uh, every result are uh, open access. So you can uh, uh, really learn from, uh, from all these uh, experiments, uh, which are free to, to read. And so, uh, voila for uh, Radon 22. And let's go to the next one, which is uh, Toron and Radon 220. And which is uh, quite more challenging. And I will start with uh, one uh, development from my colleague uh, from PTB uh, that I learned back when I was trying to develop the same kind of stomach. So, just a reminder uh, Radon 220 is a, a, a isotope of Radon. And is coming from Torium 232. Uh, so Torium 232 has a billion, uh, 14 billion year half life. And uh, you can find quite more Torium 232 in the ground than Uranium 238. 
However, Radon 220 has a very short half-life, so its concentration on, uh, in air can be very, very different uh, over the countries and is extremely dependent uh, on uh, um, ground permeability. Uh, also, when you are in house, it's extremely dependent on the material used to build houses because it won't travel much in the matter before it decays. And White Island, for example, in France, we don't have much storm, uh, but uh, in some countries and some places like in India or China, Toron uh, is at higher concentration than Radon. Uh, so it's also uh, critical to measure it properly. And it's important to know that even if it's still a uh, radiative gas, it's still emit alpha, it will decay also uh, into uh, isotope of lead, polonium, and so on. But the alpha energy, beta energy, and half-life are very different. So when you speak with the people dealing with those new to Toron, they will they told me that it's extremely different than uh, those due to radon. So it's not because you have 300 becquerel per cubic meter of toron that it will be as dangerous as uh, 300 becquerel uh, per cubic meter of, of radon to do. So that's why it's important to be able to measure both separately and to make sure you don't uh, mix them uh, when you are doing a measurement. And at the end, that's why uh, people developed standard because it was needed uh, in, the, in the past for, for people measuring radon in, uh, in ground or in houses. So the, when I tried to develop this system in LNHB, uh, I found some uh, work of my colleague at PTB, which was uh, based on the thorium-228 source and a calibrated high-purity uh, germanium detector uh, that was connected to this source to deduce the emission rate of uh, radon-220 uh, inside uh, uh, a vessel. Uh, in this case, it was a 30 liter vessel. And uh, this technique, uh, was published uh, can uh, be used uh, to deduce the uh, turn uh, concentration inside the volume, uh, which will depend in fact on the activity of thorium 228 uh, source, the emission rate, the volume of the chamber, and a kind of factor that is in fact the distribution of uh, thorium inside the vessel, uh, which ideally is equal to one because you have a homogeneous distribution, but which is in reality very difficult to have it uh, homogeneous inside the chamber. Uh, at the end, what they did is that by measuring with gamma spectrometry uh, the decay product of radon, uh, uh, like uh, lead to 12 and uh, the father of uh, uh, radon to 20, uh, radium to 24, uh, it was. Um, possible to define the emission rate of the source and then to calculate the activity concentration inside the vessel uh, with the following uh, equation that are published. And they depend on the counting rate of each uh, interesting peak, uh, minus of course the background and the uh, pro uh, gamma probability em uh, emission. Also, they propose uh, a second uh, way to do the calculation that uh, doesn't use uh, the gamma uh, intensity emission. And using this technique, they were allowed to determine uh, an emission factor for their source, but uh, uh, with dry air. And then to deduce the activity concentration of radon to 20 uh, within, uh, with a relative standard subsidy of 3% inside the chamber. So, which is quite far enough to uh, calibrate a device. Uh, however, it uh, must be uh, uh, taken into account that uh, for such shows, the emission rate depends on the humidity and temperature uh, of the gas. So, 
one must be very careful when uh, you uh, use such technique. And that's what we understood uh, and saw within the work of uh, Metro Adon project uh, with the colleague uh, from PCB uh, when we try to find a way to compare each other with our technique. So uh, what we did in the past is to try to find uh, another way to have a kind of primary standard for Toron. And the idea this time was to use a direct measurement of Toron. And to do so, we use the, the simple technique, like the one we use for radiant 226 source and uh, production of stable atmosphere. So we use a Torian 228 source. Uh, that is flush with air. Uh, typically, the thorium source was uh, from a pylon, uh, and they can be used with only with a very dry air. And uh, they allow us to uh, produce a stable concentration of uh, radon 220. Only drawback is that uh, thorium has a short half life of two years. So this kind of source, you cannot use it for many years, which is quite inconvenient. Uh, so at the end, this atmosphere is uh, going into the gas vessel and then the outlet. And our idea was to develop a device that can measure the activity concentration of toron inside this atmosphere. And what we, our work was based on uh, the idea to use a volume detector with an alpha detector because uh, radon 20 uh, emit alpha. Uh, the detection efficiency of this device was calculated by Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and the idea is to make sure that uh, from this simulation, we are able to develop a device that can have the same uh, um, detection efficiency for radon uh, to 22 and toron radon 20. This way, it was for us a way to, cal uh, to calibrate our device and to make sure our simulation are working. Of course, it must be possible to identify if we have both radon inside uh, the atmosphere because it can be quite critical. And our idea was to develop a transportable device so that it can be used by other uh, laboratories uh, to um, use it for their tour atmosphere and calibrate device. So the principle of this device uh, is uh, uh, based on a small chamber uh, that is uh, catching the decay product of radon using a very strong electric field. Uh, at the surface of an alpha detector that is linked to the ground. So the, uh, the, in this device, we have a thermal atmosphere inlet that is filtered uh, with a uh, uh, high efficiency filter uh, in order to remove all decay products that are created before entering into the detector. And then inside the detector, you will have the torrent that will decay, produce a uh, charge um, solid decay product that we have to catch immediately before they lose the charges. And so uh, the key development of this system was to combine uh, two things. One is uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And back then I was using uh, MCN PX uh, for the detection efficiency of alpha particle matter, and to combine a uh, multi physics simulation to simulate fluid transport, I mean air, uh, electric field, and charged particle transport, in this case, uh, very small side aerosol, nano side aerosols, which have some charge uh, due to the recall of. Uh, 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 alpha uh, uh, after the alpha disintegration. And using such uh, tools, uh, we find uh, a good compromise uh, where we have a quite compact detector with uh, a good detection efficiency uh, for the gas itself, 
and that can cache all the decay products immediately after they are created inside the device. This way, we could have a good spectrum to use and to measure precisely uh, the activity concentration of tone, uh, as you will see after that. So what I end up during my thesis is uh, this device. So it was possible to place it in backpack and I did it when I was a student flying to Rome and I will show you this result uh, thanks to our colleague from ENEA. Uh, the important part was to make sure we have uh, the good electronics to have a very nice, the best resolution we can with the silicon detector. So that's why we made uh, our own preamplifier. Uh, our own power supply to make sure uh, we don't have any noise, or at least that we know how it's working and we know how to fix a uh, problem immediately. And uh, a standard uh, uh, electronics to uh, get our uh, alpha spec. So with this device, uh, we were able either to measure radon, or or both. And what you can see here is one example of the first, first spectra I obtained with uh, Radon 222. Uh, in this case, I used the technique of uh, uh, primary Radon calibration uh, that I presented you before. So I created an atmosphere of Radon with one Radon standard uh, inside the chamber. And I made it circulate on the device and perform measurement over the time. So that's why you will see that the counting is decaying over the time because the radon activity construction is decaying with time. But what is important is that uh, this uh, um, uh, device was developed so that we can directly add radon uh, measurement spectra that is of course uh, disturbed by uh, uh, the atoms of air, because it's quite easy to stop alpha in air, but still that has an enough, uh, it's not really resolution, but that has enough shape so that we can discriminate it from the decay product. And here you have uh, the two decay products of radon that were caught uh, on the surface of the silicon detector and that will then produce very nice thin peak because they are just on the detector and so you have very nice uh, uh, peak with very good resolution. What we did with that is that we were able to measure the radon to, to peak uh, detection efficiency and of course we compare this to our MCNP X calculation in order to uh, validate our approach and which was the case. And, and as it was developed so that we have the same detection efficiency for Radon 2 and Radon 20, we could it was a... this simulated efficiency as a detection efficiency. And then that's what we did. And you have here an example of spectra with Radon 20. Uh, it's similar you have a large peak for Radon 20, a very thin peak for the first decay product, Polynium 216. Uh, they are both at immediate uh, equilibrium because Radon 216 has a very short half-life. And then we got the first problem that was, uh, we have a longer half-life decay product, which are bismuth 212 that appear exactly in the middle of Radon 20 peak and polonium-212 peak here, but that is less problem. And that was in fact the solution uh, because uh, we know that those two nuclei were deposited on the surface of our detector and they are at the equilibrium. So we could use the counting from lead to 12 to remove the counting from bismuth to 12 inside the torrent peak. And before doing that, of course, we have checked that everything is okay uh, with our system. And so we got this interesting spectra. The idea is that uh, 
we circulate an atmosphere of Toron during a few days in the system so that uh, the uh, decay products are caught from the detector and that uh, we reach uh, a good uh, counting statistic. Then we flush the system with clean air and we acquire spectra. And we have this nice spectra, which is a uh, bismuth 212 peaks here and polonium 212 peaks on the right. Uh, one funny thing is that here you can see a tail on the right, it's in fact a uh, beta spectrum. So at the end, uh, with such uh, this measurement, we are able to check if we have a proper um, a ratio between the alpha emission of lead to 10 and polonium to 12 uh, on our system, which we are compared to data and very, with a very nice compatibility of the result. So we are sure we are able to uh, uh, deduce uh, the good quantity. Uh, in our system, it was developed so that humidity, temperature, and pressure does not have any effect. Uh, the only remaining effect is the flux of air inside the system. Below uh, some flow rate, uh, the toron is not homogeneous inside the measurement device. So we have to use it at least at uh, flow rate higher than 0.8 liter per minute. And this is always the quite challenging part with toron because even in small volume, it's very difficult to have it uh, homogeneous. And of course, as always, when we are doing a metrology, we have to define all the parameters used in the system, what are their uncertainty, and what is the activity concentration we obtain. And in the base case, we can have 1% 1 1 of relative standard uncertainty for activity concentration. Um, uh, whether it's only if we have a high uh, activity concentration, I mean high counting statistics. And of course, we can use it to calibrate device. However, it depends on the chamber we use. This is an example of the simulation of the distribution of tone inside the LNHB chamber. We offer 125 liter. You have an inlet here, uh, the tone going inside the chamber. And we try to find the optimum position of different fan to homogenize uh, the concentration. But by simulation, we can see that we will never reach homogeneous uh, uh, activity inside the chamber due to the very short half-life. So we can measure this distrib distribution and you have a nice uh, and funny technique that we did with uh, uh, Professor Mitte from Sofia University using silica aerogel. Or the one we use is that we simply uh, sample the activity concentration very close to the uh, device to calibrate uh, inside the chamber. So just using a proper tubing and pumping. And to conclude on this system, uh, it was very difficult to find other people developing such technology. But thanks to my thesis, uh, I will thanks a lot uh, ENEA because we are able to do some kind of comparison because they were working on different techniques to measure Toron. And we managed to do one comparison I, I, in fact, I took my system, I bring it to Italy and uh, with Francesco Cardellini and Marco Caponi, we tried to, uh, to compare the results of uh, the different technology. And we were in quite uh, good agreement, uh, but INEA was still under uh, using, uh, developing and using some techniques. So, it was very the first. Uh, it was the very first time of such comparison. Just to conclude, uh, I'm not a, a pro on radon measurement uh, on site. I'm only developing standards. But just uh, what I can tell you and what I saw is that uh, when measuring radon, it, if you want to do very precise measurement on site, it can be very tricky. You don't always to do so. You don't always need to do so. And so you don't need necessary primary cal calibration. As I should show, secondary calibration is fine for on-site measurement. 
But one important part is already very important to check the linearity of instruments, because for some, you may have just a, a value of zero because they are totally saturated by high, high activity concentration. It is important to take into account the background of the detector. And often it's one of the problem of radon sensor is that with time they will be contaminated and, and you will lose uh, uh, detection limits. And so it's quite difficult to have very low activity concentration measurement. And uh, in fact, I show you that there are some techniques that were developed to calibrate radon. Uh, but there was also many studies uh, to take into account other uh, parameters. And what I saw is uh, many studies were performed during uh, Metronorm or Metro Radon project in Europe. But I believe there are also a lot of other things that were done in India and uh, China, what I saw from uh, uh, different uh, conferences and also in Africa. So there are many approach on the measurement and often the calibration, precise calibration is not uh, the most uh, important part uh, when you are starting trying to do a radon measurement. And just to conclude on this, because we are speaking about risk of radon, but radon is also very interesting for funny measurement and just few of them that I saw in the past that would like just to show you. One of the most one of the most first funny things I did is that in fact we calibrate a detector that is on Mars. In fact, it's on the rover for curiosity. And the idea is because, because radon can be very useful uh, to understand uh, uh, um, the process of transportation of noble gases in rock. And it can be used at a geophysical crater on the Martian uh, environment. And in this case, what was challenging is that on Mars, you have seven millibar of CO2. And so we had to uh, perform a calibration under this condition. And in fact, you can see here uh, with uh, a colleague from uh, Germany and NASA, and especially uh, Pierre-Yves Meslin, it was a, a lot involved in this work. Uh, the device, the copy of the device that is on Mars, uh, calibrated in IRSN uh, with uh, a, a radon primary standard to understand how we can detect radon on Mars at seven millibar of CO2. And of course, what is funny with such colleagues like Pierre-Yves Meslin, we, always have a funny idea. And now we are trying to measure radon on the moon. And this is the plan of uh, one mission of Dawn, uh, which is, uh, will be sent in the, from China in 2024. And what we saw is that the radon standard, the radon with the defined angle method can be used to understand the um, uh, the absorption of radon inside uh, Mars or Moon rock, but of course, Earth rock also. And we developed some kind of specific uh, measurement device to do so. And so I expect to show you some results later this year uh, about such a funny measurement. And one last funny is uh, some uh, specific application. In fact, in, uh, for some people, uh, they use uh, radium-226 uh, salt to place a diamond inside, uh, a white diamond, to turn it into green diamond. Uh, because when you have a green diamond, the price of this one is very, very higher. And what we did in the past is that uh, we help people to check if uh, one diamond is a real green diamond and not one that was turned with radioactivity. So typically you cannot really use uh, alpha spectrometry because radium may diffuse inside the diamond. The diamond has, uh, is already with a very complex shape. And so it's not very convenient. 
And so what we did is that we placed the diamond under a vacuum, we tamp on it, we keep it 20 days in the vacuum, and then we force the posibradon that is produced by the diamond uh, inside the chamber. And successfully, this diamond was a red green one, so we haven't found radon, but uh, on a smaller one, we find a, a very high activity of radon. So sometimes you can use all those standards to do uh, some kind of finish to be and not usual measurements. So to summary, uh, I presented you some standard, what I know about it. Of course, I don't know everything. I try to, to find uh, the one I know and some of my colleagues. Um, at the end, this standard can are uh, used in many countries. Uh, it's always uh, very nice to see that there are some exchange with other laboratory and you can share each other with a uh, standard that they try to learn about the method and so on. Uh, all these standards can be used and adapted to calibrate commercial device. Uh, Unfortunately for Togo, for now, we don't have international traceability. There are still some more work to do. Uh, and one important point about calibration uh, of such devices is to know how it's working, know the linearity, and know that everything uh, uh, will go well during the calibration. Of course, there are still some uh, complementary development, just a few words about what we are doing. Uh, we recently uh, tried to find a good way to measure the time response of measurement, uh, uh, radon measurement device. Uh, we have developed a radon in water standard that uh, you will find some details uh, later this year. And of course, we are working on adsorption and desorption of radon from various material, but mainly from Moon, Mars, and uh, meteorites. Of course, there are also many long-term work to do because uh, we always speak about radon, but in fact, it's the decay product of radon that are dangerous. And for now, there is no standard uh, of those uh, decay products. Uh, just to conclude, um, much of this work uh, I presented, at least for the one in IHB, was funded by the French National Meteorology Institute. And of course, many are coming from European project and still they continue. Like uh, in the next project that you should expect very nice results in the next month and years. And of course, there are many other projects about Radon and other problematics, uh, which are not linked to, to standardization, but uh, there are many topics about it some around the world. So it's always a, um, a very active subject. So thank you for your attention.